The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I'm Darren Jaime. And as always, every week we invite you to join with us here on this particular show. Somebody asked, what is the Social Justice Forums about? Well, we talk about the inequities that many people face. We also talk about civic engagement, and then we also promote being involved. Great conversation, great guests. Once you stay with us, the Social Justice Forums begins right now. And welcome back to the show. Well, despite several lockdowns across the nation and fewer people were on the roads, the number of actual traffic deaths has increased. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, out of over 38,000 people who were killed in crashes last year, over 7,000 were African-American. Our next guest shares a little bit about this. States, locals, and federal governments how they can work together to improve these roadways to reduce the number of fatalities amongst black drivers. Joining us now is the partner, Levine and Slavitt, PLLC, Ira Slavitt, and uh, Ira, good to have you. Thank you, great to be here, John. When I look at those statistics, definitely very challenging and very harrowing statistics, 38,000 people uh, with traffic safety, with traffic, were killed in crashes. But then we look at African Americans and we see this high number. Um, what is the correlation here? You know, I, I read that there's a saying, I don't know if it really is or not, that when America gets a cold, Black America gets the flu. And it seems like uh, to some extent that's what's happening with these uh, traffic fatalities. A study done by the Governor's Highway Safety Association discovered Blacks are killed, killed consistently higher rates than whites. And that doubles when it comes to pedestrians. And there's another report by Smart Growth America, which is a DC-based urban development ad advocacy group, found that Black pedestrians from 2010 to 2019 were 82%, that's 82% more likely than whites to be hit by drivers. And yet another study by the University of Nevada discovered that drivers are less likely to slow down for Black pedestrians. And, and there seem to be a number of different reasons that might explain that, different factors. One uh, is that during COVID, uh, more minority and Black workers had to actually go to their job. They could not work from home. And so that put them more at risk. Um, also, uh, many families could not afford a car or grocery delivery, other conveniences. So they would have to go out and again, make themselves a little more vulnerable. Um, also, the workers that uh, did have to go to work often were paid hourly wages, so they would have real incentive to, to get there on time, uh, which might not have led to the best safety choices. Uh, one other um, factor that's um, been really uh, attributed to this phenomenon is the fact that the just the infrastructure of roads and um, infrastructure in minority neighborhoods is just uh, not as good as elsewhere. Uh, one of the reasons uh, seems to be that during the construction of uh, the interstate highway system and for other reasons, um, a lot of communities were displaced or cut off from uh, other communities. Um, and um, the actually uh, infrastructure bill that the Senate just passed, the US Senate actually tries to address um, some of that um, they've allocated um, $10 billion to reconnect communities. So hopefully that'll survive the legislative process. Yeah, let me delve a little bit further into that because when you talk about minority communities and communities of color, uh, oftentimes you will hear that uh, people within these communities are making phone calls downtown to uh, public officials, city hall, really trying to get their streets maintained. And when you look at, you know, whether it's snow removal or uh, basic construction needs, it seems as though minority communities always come up with the short end of the stick. Well, the statistics show that this year, 2021, the first six months of this year had the most fatalities in terms of motor vehicle crashes. Uh, it's the deadliest first half of any year under 
Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration. So rather than these calls may be helping things, they're actually, things are getting worse. Um, hopefully, you know, things will be um, done to, to address that. As far as there is some state legislation uh, designed working its way through, it's called the Crash Victims Rights and Safety Act. It's actually eight bills combined um, that address certain things um, that give uh, crime victim, uh, sorry, accident victims, some rights that are similar somewhat to the Crime Victims Rights Act so they can have better access to information. Uh, it might lower the proper or the, um, the minimum alcohol, blood alcohol level, might give municipalities the ability to lower the speed limit even more than they have now. And that's one thing that uh, I think that the de Blasio administration should get some credit for is they did lower the speed limit from 30 uh, to 25 miles an hour in the city. Uh, some people, I'm sure, found that inconvenient, but it, it does save, uh, reduce the number of accidents and also the um, severity of accidents. And when we talk about that, uh, accidents as a whole, a lot of people are involved in accidents and some for the very first time. Some end up in fatalities, but the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people end up in minor fender benders to, you know, serious fender benders. Walk us through an accident. If an individual is involved in an accident, sometimes people don't know their rights and what they should do. So let's take it from the perspective that, hey, I'm involved in a car accident uh, with another with another vehicle. Thank God it's not so serious, but it is serious enough that there's damage involved to both vehicles. What should I do, particularly when I know that I'm in the right? Well, th thank you, Darren. And as you as you say, the, the safety and health is the most important thing. And so the first thing you should do is make sure uh, that you and the occupants of your vehicle are okay. Um, a lot of what goes on at accident scenes that, that will help people later, um, one thing is, is police report will help because it will change other people from changing their stories, especially in the situation as you gave Darren, where you know that, that you're in the right. Um, sometimes, People are not always, uh, later on, they have a chance to recreate a little bit what happened. Um, but an important thing is to preserve as much information and get as much information as you can at the accident scene. So that could involve taking photographs of both your vehicle and the other vehicle, not necessarily details of the damage, but more overall shots. Even, even parts of uh, vehicles that are not damaged, take photos of that because uh, you don't want somebody to have another accident and say that the, later and say that that came from your accident. Photographs are useful. Make sure you get the information from the other party. License registration. Don't let somebody tell you they're in a hurry. We had a situation. Somebody was in an accident. The other driver was said, I'm an Uber driver. I've got a passenger. He's got to get to the airport or whatever the excuse was and drove off. And it was a, it was a huge problem. Um, so those are really um, the primary things. And also be careful what you say to anybody at the scene of accident, um, especially somebody who you don't know. These days in New York, it's legal to record a conversation as long as one person consents. So if you're doing the recording, you can be that one person who consents. So you want to be careful not to say something that might get used against you uh, later. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about attorneys because you have to get an attorney involved, especially when there's accidents and a victim or you're really just trying to seek damages because we do understand negotiating with insurance companies are not always the easiest thing. So for a person who may not necessarily have an attorney or challenged in affording an attorney, uh, being able to afford an attorney, uh, what, are, what are the options? Well, you're right, Darren. You do have to be very careful in your conversations with insurance companies, even your own insurance company, because it may come about that the other vehicle doesn't have insurance and your, your remedy is against your own insurance company. Uh, and you have to be careful not to give any kind of recorded statement that might be used against you. As far as hiring an attorney, most attorneys that handle these types of cases will take the case on a contingent percentage fee basis so that they will, their fee will, you will only owe the attorney a fee based on the amount of recovery that they get for you. Um, so there are different ways to find an attorney. Uh, you can do it online. Also, many of the bar associations, whether it's a county bar association or a city bar or a state bar, they have 
a lawyer referral services that lawyers can register for, and you might want to contact them uh, for a recommendation instead of relying on what's on the internet. But time can be of the essence as far as contacting an attorney because there are time limits to file, whether it's a claim for no fault for your own medical benefits or claims against the responsible other vehicle or, prop or pro possibly there's a problem with the uh, road design and, or an infrastructure problem, you have to file uh, something or serve a governmental entity. You, it's a real problem. Um, some of those deadlines are 30 days for no fault or 90 days for the uh, governments. Yeah. We hear a lot of times this painful story. You're a person that's involved in an accident. It's the other person's fault, but then you find out the other person has no insurance. What happens for that person that is the innocent party in this? Do they actually get left with footing the bill and going back and forth with their insurance company? That's an excellent question. So two things. One is uh, I referred to no fault benefits. That has that's a benefit that covers or those benefits cover your out of pocket expenses like for hospital, ambulance, doctors, loss of earnings. That comes from your own insurance company, and that's mandatory that you have that coverage. There's another part of your insurance policy called the supplementary uninsured motorist coverage, and that comes into play in exactly the situation that you described, Darren, where the other vehicle doesn't have insurance uh, or maybe doesn't have as much insurance as you do. And then you, uh, that is also mandatory, at least in terms of a $25,000 limit per person and 50,000 total per accident. Um, that's required in every insurance policy. So if the other vehicle doesn't have coverage, you file a claim with your own insurance company um, um, for that. Yeah. And, and just one piece of advice for people, because uh, you can have, let's say, $100,000 of liability coverage, which protects your assets if you're negligent. But if somebody else is negligent, it's the amount of insurance coverage that you have under the supplementary uninsured coverage that matters. So you should try to maximize your supplementary uninsured coverage. Um, and those premiums are significantly less than for liability coverage. Yeah. Types of compensation, when you talk about receiving money from an accident, a lot of people say, well, it's a flat out one way thing, but there are different types of compensation that an individual can receive. Can you share with us a little bit about the types of compensation that an individual can get uh, when involved in an accident? In New York, we have a system of compensatory damages. So you can recover not as a punishment for the other uh, driver's conduct, but to compensate you for the loss, the injuries, the loss of uh, income beyond no fault that, that you've sustained. So that involves bringing a lawsuit against the uh, other vehicle, the owner or the driver. Um, with respect, and, and that's in terms of injuries, with respect to wrongful death, or if someone is killed in an accident, uh, New York State provides that there is, in addition to the conscious pain and suffering of the person who was killed, there is a recovery for the financial loss to the estate. Um, now that, that, the estate meaning the, the next of kin in the family. Now that actually in New York is another uh, issue um, that involves inequality because being limited to the financial loss as opposed to the emotional grief of losing a loved one, that works to the disadvantage of someone who maybe is a homemaker, doesn't have, doesn't earn wages or their wages aren't, uh, that uh, significant or they're elderly and they're retired. Um, and so that is an unfair uh, situation in New York. There is something uh, legislation pending called the New York, uh, in New York, the Grieving Families Act, um, which I actually, last time I was on, I misspoke. I thought it had been passed and was awaiting a decision by the governor whether to sign it, but actually, um, and I apologize for that. That law passed in the Judiciary Committees in both the Assembly and the New York State Senate. Uh, but that's, I think, as far as they got. And those, you talk about calls to, to legislators uh, to fix the roads, that might be something that the communities might be interested in, in getting in touch with their legislatures and, and rectifying that. New York is in the minority of states in this country that do not allow the families to recover for their emotional grief for the loss of a loved one. Pretty challenging, pretty challenging there. When you talk about no fault 
it's something that we know here in New York. Many people outside of New York may not necessarily be so familiar with uh, No Fault. Talk about No Fault for a moment and how that actually applies. No Fault Insurance, which you may see in your declarations page on the insurance policy, um, is called Personal Injury Protection or PIP. That provides your economic laws or compensation for your economic laws. And that's something you have a 30 day uh, time limit to apply for to the insurance company. And you do not have to prove anybody was at fault. Um, basically, that that's part of the, the system is it, it, even if it's your fault, even if the accident is 100% your fault, unless you're, you're driving drunk or recklessly or some other uh, things or on, on a motorcycle, um, you can get your medical bills and some lost earnings paid without having to prove fault. It's just as long as it's related uh, to the uh, motor vehicle accident, you will get no fault coverage. Um, and that, that could apply, uh, that also would apply if you're a pedestrian, it would be the vehicle that hit you usually that provides no fault coverage. And uh, if I could just go back for one second, that uninsured situation also applies, not, even, not only if you, are, uh, if you have a car, but you are a pedestrian and you're hit by another car that's negligent, your own policy might come into play and give you extra benefits, even though your vehicle was not involved in the accident. And that could also apply to members of your household and family. Yeah. Before we go, I just want to get an opportunity to hear from you about some common trends that you're finding, particularly when it comes to accidents and those uh, particularly in communities of color. Well, you, you know, we... Uh, the, the trends that, that I see are really not that different than, than what's reported. Um, you know, there's just, uh, there, there's some more traffic back out now. Uh, there was a point where the phones were kind of quiet. This goes back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, but now people are out and about and we're finding that um, people are again, being exposed to the risks of being pedestrians um, and we're, we're here to, to try to help them as best we can. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forum. Some, mu some much needed information when it comes to regards to accidents and what a person needs to know. Unfortunately, it's only when a person gets in the actual situation that they actually now have to work it out. And many times people are so unprepared, but thank you for giving us some uh, well-needed information and some well-needed tips. Thanks much. Thank you very much, uh, my pleasure. All righty. Well, Iris Slavitt here with us on the Social Justice Forums. I want you to stay with us. We've got more show coming up in a few. dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, 
and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. And we welcome you back to the show. The Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies is an anti-poverty policy and advocacy organization that's committed towards economic opportunity and upward mobility. Now, FPWA has long served New York City's social service system, providing support grants to help low-income groups meet basic needs while advocating for fair policies, or I should say public policies, on behalf of the people in need and the agencies that serve them. Joining us now to share a little bit more is the CEO and Executive Director of FPWA, Jennifer Jones Austin. And uh, Jennifer, glad to have you with us. I'm glad to be with you, and I'm honored and appreciative for this opportunity. Well, certainly, we're glad to have you as well. And for somebody that may not be so familiar with FPWA, uh, a little bit about your organization. So it's a nearly 100-year-old organization. In fact, next year, the organization will recognize its 100th anniversary. It was created back in 1922 at a time in New York City when social services were doled out based on race and religion. So if you were white and of the Jewish faith, you were cared for by Jewish institutions. If you were white and Catholic, uh, you were cared for by Catholic charities. And as we know, uh, you know, if you're of the Protestant faith, often it becomes a catch-all. And so people who identified as Protestant were cared for by Protestant organizations. And even if you weren't, if you didn't identify as Jewish or Catholic, you pretty much got lumped into the Protestant uh, grouping. And you know, with social services being doled out like that, it was determined that there needed to be at the decision-making table with government, an organization that would represent the needs of Protestant communities, Protestant organizations, individuals and families identifying as Protestant. We've been at it now for nearly 100 years. The interesting thing is, whereas when the organization was first founded, it was largely Protestant only, nonprofits serving Protestant individuals and families, and others, again, didn't identify as any of the others. Today, we have more organizations under our umbrella, which is like 170 plus member agencies. We have more organizations that are secular than Protestant, and we also have um, organizations that identify as being Jewish based, Muslim, Buddhist, and Catholic. And the way that I think about it as a child of the church is that, you know, we're just like doing the work of the Good Samaritan. We're not trying to figure out who you are and who you identify. We're just concerned about every individual, every family in New York that is struggling and working to make sure that their needs are met. Yeah. And I know with such a diverse population and groups represented, you tackle a diverse group of issues. and. I want to delve into a few of those issues that uh, you guys tackle. And I know one is the issue of police brutality and, uh, you know, criminal justice reform, but more particularly the area of police brutality. Uh, we've seen a lot, and I know that George Floyd's, uh, the conviction of Derek Chauvin has actually heightened uh, that conversation. But uh, this been, it's been a longstanding conversation. Uh, share with us your thoughts. So we look at the issue of police brutality um, in its kind of entirety, like what is it rooted in? And we all know that racism plays a significant factor in police misconduct, disproportionate uh, policing, disproportionate use, excessive use of force by the police against black and brown communities. What we often don't talk about though is the additional uh, factor that poverty plays. Uh, here in New York City, we often talk about you know, the communities with the greatest concentration of black and brown persons being overly policed, where we see you know, greater incidents of stop and frisk, which still continues today, despite you know, what has happened over the last several years to curtail it, it still continues. What we often don't talk about is the added element, a significant factor of poverty. If you look at the community districts here in New York City with the highest rate 
of justice involvement, arrest, and incarceration, you will find that they are also the communities with the highest rates of people of color living residing in them. But they also are the communities with the highest rates of persons with low income. And so at FPWA, we center on that, like kind of that, that, that trifecta, that three-legged stool, that in America, when you think about justice involvement, you have to look at how race and poverty play an integral role. And so that's the way that we come at it. How do we address uh, and, and get to the decriminalization uh, of race as well as the decriminalization of poverty? And when we talk about you know, the issues with the police department, we know that broken window policing is really huge. For our viewers who may not be so familiar, and we're trying to educate them uh, on this particular matter, give us the definition from your perspective of what broken window policing actually is and what you'd like to see happen. So broken windows theory uh, was created several, many years ago, I guess it's maybe now going about back 20, 25 years here in New York City. Uh, maybe it was something that was done in other jurisdictions, but it was brought or state cities, was brought here back about 20, 25 years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And what broken windows theory is essentially, it's a theory um, that if you address the kids, like the activities that are kind of a low level, you know, offenses that are conducted at a low level misdemeanor rate, and you nip them in the bud then, there, then that will cut off what, you know, like, you know, mounting crimes. So broken windows, kids throwing uh, rocks at broken windows just to make it plain. Kids right. throwing rocks at broken windows, right? That's a low level crime, right? Maybe it gets you a summons, maybe it gets you a misdemeanor. The theory is if you stop the kids, then at that point, then they won't go on to commit larceny. They won't go on to commit burglary, rob robbery. They won't kind of get like, you know, that kind of feeling in their system and go out and start doing the crimes. The crackdown on it has been to then crack down on like the, the people who commit these lower level offenses, but kind of to do it in a harsh manner. Like let's like, you know, nip it in the bud. You know, let's exact a punishment upon you now. Not doing it through a preventive approach. Right, and so that's the criticism with broken windows theory. It's not just like exact punishment. Let's look at why young, young people may be engaging in these misdemeanor type crimes. Is it that they don't have enough after school supports or recreational activities? They're not leaned into to address what may be some of the things that have them on the street when they could be engaged in things that are more meaningful and value add. So our response is, Let's not treat the, the problem, let's treat the underlying issue. And, and that's what we believe is key to keeping communities and people safe without overly, you know, like um, policing black and brown communities. Let's we talk about over, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, but when we, when we talk about over-policing, one of the things that we know about over-policing is use of force. Uh, what really got America shaking their head and when we say our allies, those people, we've seen it all the time in the African-American community, communities of color, this use of force. But I think it really began to hit home for a lot of people watching the death of George Floyd. And even though that's Minneapolis, we know that we've got our own challenges across New York City. What would you like to see happen by way of use of force here? So um, first and foremost, uh, we need to, at the federal level, continue to push for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that would do everything from, uh, you know, uh, a tying federal funding uh, for police uh, uh, departments across the states to making sure that they implement certain mandates around like a data registry that ensures bad cops can't get fired and move from one locality to another locality. You know, and be back in the business of exacting excessive force upon people, exerting excessive force upon people. Uh, uh, provisions against uh, use of chokehold bans at the federal level. What it does is it begins to set up what is a federal uh, set of you know policies and provisions in the form of legislation that serves to protect people against excessive use of force. But we also need to be doing the same thing at the state level. Here in New York, we have had some movement. We had some movement under Governor Cuomo uh, to bring about greater protections but much more needs to be done. Much more needs to be done at the local level. We've had a, uh, a report that was presented to 
New York State uh, body, and this, I guess, maybe back in March of this year, that speaks to greater accountability, uh, greater discipline, but we've got to make sure that we have the enforcement me mechanisms in place, greater enforcement by the Civilian Complaint Review Board, a greater accountability by the NYPD to make sure that they adhere to the changes that bring about greater protections for people, and particularly yeah. people of color. Yeah. What brought George Floyd to uh, the forefront was the fact that a young girl actually captured that on camera. And the discussion continues now, right here in New York City, about body cams and yeah. having body cams and the use of body cams. To me, no brainer. But no brainer. to the policies that be, it's something totally different. Um, give me your perspective on body cams. What would you like to see happen there? And uh, why is it so hard to do something that seems so reasonable? So, you know, I think it's so hard. I mean, like there, there's a, there's a, there, there had been a similar debate in corrections, uh, in the jails. Do correction officers have to use uh, body cams or, you know, should there be technology that controls where you can see what's going on in the jails at all times? I think ultimately it comes down to um, two things. One, there are cops who are doing things they should not be doing. They are using their power and the badge to exert, you know, like a uh, fluent uh, force and uh, un, you know, undue influence over people. And there's a concern about that being caught. Uh, the unions play a great role in this. The Police Benevolent Association is a very strong union here in New York City. And they're not in favor of these things because then this, this information caught on camera can be used against their cops when it comes to proceedings, disciplinary proceedings. So that's part of it. I think the larger part of it um, is just kind of a universal feeling. Uh, you and I in our day jobs don't have people watching over our shoulder every single thing that we do. Um, and you know, there aren't many places where that is happening. And so there is this sense of people are human, people make mistakes. And what if everything I did, you know, like during my eight hours plus of work was caught on camera, I might not be my best self. The difference, the distinction to be drawn is when I'm not my best self, it isn't necessarily resulting in the death, the potential death of another individual, another mm. individual. And so, you know, we, you know, certain liberties have to be done away with. Uh, certain freedoms have to be done away with. I think that body cameras should be worn by every cop. And when they are off and, you know, like what is happening isn't reported, then these cops, and frankly, I dare say, not just simply when something bad happens. If it's found that certain cops have their cameras off when they shouldn't, even if nothing bad happens, they should be disciplined for that because that then becomes a deterrent to keeping it off. Yeah, I, I just happen to think if everybody's got cameras and Big Brother's watching everybody else, I don't understand why Big Brother can't watch and put camera on, on himself. I just don't get it myself, but- You know, to your point, to your <laughs> point, uh, I sometimes, I, I, I look at my my iPhone mm -hmm. and it's telling me where where I'm gonna, where how long it's gonna take me to get to my next destination. And it sometimes tell me that it's got, how long it's gonna take me to get to places I'm not even going. Or, you know, you'll Google something and the next thing you know, you turn around mm -hmm. and the computer is giving you all types of information about that thing that you Google. We are being watched. Yeah. And so, I mean, I understand why we can't see it from that. They can't see it from that perspective. Uh, one thing I know that a big conversation is being had is about the demilitariz demilitarization, I should say, of police and when we see them. When we look before, you know, back in the day growing up, Officer Friendly, the most he had was, you know, the gun and the nightstick and that was it. And I know that things have gotten worse. I know that things have gotten progressively worse. But when we look at what we're seeing right now uh, and we see particular scenes, uh, it does look like a war zone sometimes in our very own communities. And uh, the call, the cry has been for the demilitarization of, of police. Where do you stand on that? on board and uh, I, you know we don't have a lot of time but I could spend an hour talking about this and essentially talking about the system in which we're living. I'm doing I'm chairing the New York City Racial Justice Commission uh, and a lot of my thinking is actually rooted in the teachings of my father. My father was uh, a pastor in Brooklyn, New York and a civil rights leader. He along with several other ministers including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr 
founded the Progressive National Baptist Convention to bring the church into the social justice and civil rights movement. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was in place, but that was really a conference of leaders of faith. It was not churches actually being involved in, in the movement as well. My father wrote a book, <clears throat> actually it's a book that I just republished, titled God in the Ghetto, A Prophetic Word Revisited. And in the book, he essentially breaks down the system, the system of racism, capitalism, and militarism, all designed to work in concert to continually oppress people of color. And essentially what he helps us to appreciate in this book in deconstructing the system is that capitalism it's kind of the end, it's like kind of the end game, right? And capitalism in a society where we've determined that some people will have and some people will not. Racism is an instrument. It's the social construct that enables and that props of capitalism because with racism, we decide, or I should say they decided, our founding fathers and those who followed in power, decided that white persons would have and all other persons of colors would have less. So you then use racism, racist policies, practices, legislation, and the like to further enable and allow capitalism to continue to hold. Why do we have wage inequity? Because it's an, an, an racist wage inequity, because that then allows for capitalism to thrive because then it limits the purchasing power, which then builds equity for persons of color. Militarism. Militarism is a tool that's employed to against people of color across the world and increasingly in America to actually kind of like beat, if you will, or, or push people into submissive states. If I fear the police are going to kill me, then maybe I'm not going to act out. I'm not going to revolt. I'm not going to question. I'm just going to be submissive. And so you see militarized practices in many of our communities of color because it's an act of trying to get people to be more submissive and to not revolt against systems that don't work to their benefit. Well, before we go, I definitely want to get an opportunity for people who want to get connected to your organization, find out how they can really support the movement and, and things you have going on. Please tell us how. So visit us at www.fpwa.org. And the other thing that I would implore you to do is to visit www.nyc.gov backslash NYC um, racial justice. Um, essentially, I, I'm chairing a racial justice commission and we're trying to address how our government in its, in its charter, its constitution, allows racism to be propped up in everything from who gets jobs in New York City, who works with the city, who partners, who gets contracts, as well as who has decision-making power and who has access to power. So check us out. We'll definitely do that. Jennifer Jones, Austin, been a pleasure having you here on the Social Justice Forums, and uh, certainly uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you. All righty. Well, we want you to stay with us. We do have more show. Social Justice Forums continues in a moment.
And welcome back to the show. More than a thousand people are killed by police violence each year in America. Campaign Zero is a policy reform campaign encouraging policymakers to focus on solutions with the strongest evidence of effectiveness at reducing police violence. Now, the campaign believes by implementing the right policy and systemic changes, there can be an end to police killings and other forms of police violence in the United States. Joining me now to discuss more is the co-founder of Campaign Zero, DeRay McKesson. And uh, DeRay, good to have you. It's so good to be here. Well, when we talk front and center about the issue of police, I think we can have hours worth of conversation. Uh, but when we talk about where we are today, policy, um, and really shifting the narrative towards policy, um, give me a little bit about your organization's work and how policy is a part of that. Yes, yeah, so I was one of the original protesters in Ferguson in 2014. And at the end of those protests every day, we were in the street for 400 days. We were trying to figure out how do we end police violence? What's the structural fix? So one of the first projects we did was a, camp, a site called Mapping Police Violence, where we just literally mapped out how many people the police were killing. There wasn't good data back then. You know, now we know the police kill about 1,100 people a year. You, know, you think about 2020. In 2020, the police killed more people than every single year of data we have except for one. If the police killed you before 2013, we literally don't know, which is sort of wild. So that was our ground zero. And then we went on to do the first ever campaign around police unions and then the first ever campaign around use of force policies. And those are really our three big anchor projects. And, and we do a lot more now, but those are the three big ones uh, that we continue to do that were the first things that we did. Yeah. And when we think about what these numbers look like, they're very startling. Uh, it's not startling to us because we know exactly what's happening. But when you take that number and you share it with the wider population, um, what is what response do you get? It's interesting. I think that you know, 2020 was a was a weird year because there was so much publicity around the protests that people felt like it was getting better. They were like, you know what? Like we went outside, things changed, and the numbers actually showed the opposite. Things did not change. Things stayed as bad as they had been. And it's a reminder that the police are sort of impervious to bad PR. That unless the structures change, unless the rules change, and the police are sort of fine. So. That's sort of the takeaway from 2020. I think that what we also realize that there are a lot of people and, and legislators across legislatures across the country who really want to do well. We just have to figure out how to how to show them what the well looks like. And most people in the criminal justice space, the experts focus on prisons, jails, and arrests. They actually don't focus on the police. And we sort of start from a police first perspective, because we'd say you can't name three ways you get to prison or jail that don't include a police officer. The police are actually the beginning of all of this. Yeah. And when you look at the police, obviously, there's a lot that needs to be discussed. Uh, you know, how the community can actually play a part of that. You did say three ways that you don't you end up going to jail and the police are in all three of them. There's no way there's no way around it. They're going to be connected. But community also plays an important part, too, in terms of how there's oversight with the police. Um, we know that there's civilian complaint review boards. Some have been approved across the United States. Some are being rejected. Uh, how do we l approach the issue of community oversight uh, when we've got these massive issues that are happening within the police department? Yeah, I think really the devil's in the details. So most of the civilian oversight boards have very little power and have not been very effective. You think about New York, it's probably one of the most uh, effective in the country. And still, the best they can do is make a recommendation, right? They can recommend things to the chief. The chief doesn't have to take them. Uh, that's not really oversight. We think that the community is the best arbiter of how safe the community is and what that looks like. And they should be able to fire police officers. They should be able to fire police chief. You think about places like Wisconsin, they've had a very old law, a uh, hundred years old, uh, that gives a group of citizens the power to fire the police chief. The problem is that that committee is 100% appointed by the mayor. Yeah, the mayor right. also appoints the police, right? So it's like you find these interesting models, but there's always a wrinkle somewhere in the details. So part of the work is to do real civilian oversight where there is a, a group of civilians who have the power and the authority you know, in Maryland, there's a police reform bill that just passed last year that will be one of the first that really does put the power in the hand of civilians to make disciplinary decisions. Mm. When we talk about, you know, the power, community policing is huge. And I mean, when we talk about the community having a large, well, a large, uh, let me put it like this, the community having a large impact in the way that things are determined. Uh, but I want to talk for a minute about police reform. And this really what this you know the segment is really going to center on a lot is about reform and when we talk about reform i know one of the issues that comes to mind when we talk about reform is 
uh, accountability and how that accountability is actually played out. When you look at the issue of accountability amongst police officers, we know in New York you've got 50A, where we now get to find out about disciplinary measures concerning police. Um, what other areas of reform really strike out to you that you'd like to see hit home? So the, you know, the first bucket is about reducing the power of the police. We should restrict heavily when they can use force. We should make sure that they can't do high speed chases. You know, we should restrict when they can do no knock raids. Like there's a host of things that like, they just have a lot of power that is used in ways that have no measures of success and no accountability. So like, that's one. The second is part of it is actually just investing in alternatives to police. In New York, there's a great study that was done about a decade ago that showed that uh, for every 10 nonprofits that, it, that exist in a neighborhood, crime decreases. And that makes sense. The more support people have, different options they make that makes total sense and the third is mass incarceration ending mass incarceration that we lock up far too many people for the most simple things and it's like should you you know in new jersey today if you steal over 200 dollars, that's considered a felony you can get up to 18 months in prison in new jersey for stealing over 200 dollars. that's wild why right uh, so the third part is those things and i think about these these three strategies all in tandem and when we think about broken window policing, I had a conversation just earlier on the show talking about bo broken window policing. It's something that it continues to exist, but it's also something that needs to end. Yeah, yeah. so like broken level, broken windows, uh, broken windows policing is this idea of uh, this idea that the low level offenses really matter. So if you focus on the low level things, you stop the big things. So that's why you arrest the graffiti artist, because if you arrest them, it sends a signal. That's like the idea. The reality is that like it doesn't. And that like, do you, you know, even if I think graffiti is bad, do I need to put you in a cage? No, right? Even if I think stealing like a pack of gum is a bad thing, uh, we can think about accountability that doesn't lead to cages. And that's where we sort of fight the police on this idea that the only accountability is putting people in cages. And what we would say is that our, our real lives show something different. You've had conflict in your life. You've been in school, you've been in church, you've been at home where people have done wrong things and putting people in cages wasn't like the first or best or only option. Right, well, give me uh, a little bit more about this issue here. I talk a lot about residency and how residency actually could actually make a difference. When we talk about police officers, many times, Police officers are not living within the city, particularly in New York City. You don't have to live there. There's no residency requirement. In fact, there's a decree that says you, you don't have to worry about living in the city. And the argument is, well, New York City is pretty expensive to live in, so our people live outside of there. But there's something to be said about cultural competency. When an officer actually lives in the community, you become a part of the community, you treat the community different. Agree, disagree? Yeah, so uh, it is less about whether I agree or not. The data doesn't necessarily support this idea that residency matters. Uh, just like there's a slim argument that the race of officers matters. Uh, there's a, a research that suggests that when the department's over 30% black, then officers do use less force. And there's also a scant research that suggests that more women officers actually lead to less force. But here's the thing about residency or not residency. Imagine if you had a job where you knew it was impossible to get in trouble. It doesn't matter if you live next door to me. It doesn't matter if you live 10 towns over or three states over. You'll do whatever you want. And that's not really a residency thing. And that's really the police issue that, you know, you know that Derek Chauvin got convicted in, in Minneapolis, which you probably all know is that the police get 1,100 people a year and the highest number of convictions ever in a given year is 11. Yeah. 11. 11. Yeah. So, like you, so 1%, right? So, like, as an right. officer who kills... 99% chance to not get convicted. And the likelihood that you get fired is also really, really slim, you know? Yeah. And that's and that's scary and that's horrible. One of the things that really made the difference for the George Floyd case was that it was on videotape, but it wasn't a body cam per se that got it. It was a young lady that got it. Now we have the conversation about body cams. Talk to me about where you stand in seeing body cams on all police officers. Yeah, so there's an argument to me that we should film the police, whether it's dash cams, whether it's citizens, whether it's body cams, if not only because seeing is believing that we said this stuff was happening for years and people didn't believe it until they saw it. Remember that George Floyd's death was listed as a medical emergency first. It was not listed as murder. They said that he essentially had a heart attack. 
until we saw the video. So videos have been important. The hard part is that even with videos in a lot of places, it hasn't led to what you and I would consider to be accountability. Chauvin was sort of like the perfect storm. It was the police, remember the police chief testified against Derek Chauvin, right? right? So it was like, you know, every, if he didn't get convicted, it would have been really wild because everything coalesced. But again, he is still just one of a handful. Again, the highest number ever in a given year is 11. And there's a lot of body camera footage out there. Yeah. So talk to me about your work. I mean, obviously you do a lot in, in the area of advocacy and dealing with policy. Uh, you mentioned that you were out there in Ferguson. Walk us through that experience of just being out there in Ferguson. Yeah, you know, it was, it, it's so interesting the way time moves because 2014 feels so old to a lot of people that they don't <laughs> even remember that. Uh, but what was so powerful about 2014 is that uh, there were no organizations that started the protests. Like people came outside and said enough is enough. People like just cut coming outside and, and saying enough was enough. And it really spread across the world and the country in a really beautiful way. It set the foundation for the summer of 2020. It allowed people to start to think about and scrutinize the police. Remember in St. Louis in 2014, it was a no fly zone over St. Louis. They're like, that's why there's no aerial footage of the protests. Everything we did was on Twitter. Uh, there was no Instagram live, Facebook live. Like we were, we were using Vine. It was illegal to stand still in 2014 in St. Louis. If we stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested. I mean, it was a really wild place uh, that really set everybody up to think about this issue differently. But to some extent, it is the work of what went on in Ferguson and really the advocacy and really stepping out and being aggressive about saying enough is enough that really paved the way for what we saw even in George Floyd. Absolutely. And without Ferguson, there is nothing else. It, that's why it's so hard to see it be erased in the national conversation, because people act like 2020 just emerged. You know, I know a lot of people who did nothing in 2014 and they regretted it and they said if the moment ever rises again i will do something and i think 2020 for a lot of people was that moment they watched 2014 from home they saw us in the street and they were like wow i probably should have stepped up and they were radicalized over those couple years in between 2014 and 2020 and then when 2020 comes they're like i got it they're like i'm gonna put my body on the line too because this matters and it's like yes yeah so you are the co-founder of campaign zero talk to us about campaign zero so yeah, so we're focused on solutions. So there are 19 states that have passed use of force uh, laws in the past year, over 350 cities. It's the single biggest reduction in the power of the police in American history. Uh, every single law restricting no-knock raids we wrote, there are about nine states that did it in the past year. And we lead the work on limiting the power of police unions across the country. So those are some of the campaigns that we have. But, but that's our thing is that like the police know intimately that unless the system changes, nothing will change. Yeah. And talk to us about the New York City Police Department, because obviously uh, we've had our runs with uh, Pat Lynch several times, uh, you know, just really trying to understand where he's coming from. And for most of us uh, who work in the field of journalism, we can honestly say that it's been a quite challenge to uh, to, to get some leveling from him uh, in many in many areas. But for, as one that works in policy advocacy and working uh, with police unions, uh, talk to us about your work uh, and how you perceived uh, the New York City Police Department. Yeah, so the NYPD, uh, you know, has all of its challenges that we know it's the biggest police department in the country. One of the biggest with regard to discipline is that the police chief has the sole power to discipline all 30,000 officers. He alone does, which is wild. Uh, so <laughs> there really is no oversight mechanism. He doesn't have to really do anything. So there's a lot that just gets swept under the rug, a lot that just never happens because there is no other mechanism for anybody else, including the mayor, to discipline a police officer in New York City. Remember that the NYPD settles around 200 to 300 million dollars a year because of police misconduct which is wild so you know a lot of problems the civilian review board uh, does investigations they do make recommendations but they're non-binding so one of the biggest changes in the city would be to change that you what is your focus on right now so same thing, still the police. So we're ramping up for next legislative cycle. So we have a lot of campaigns that we're percolating on, trying to get ready for January when most of the legislatures open back up. You probably didn't know, I didn't know that places like Nevada only pass laws every other year. So some no, of I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, no, not everybody passes laws every year. So we're trying to get ready for the places that do pass laws next year and then do some groundwork in the places that, are, that aren't gonna pass laws to the next year. Wow. So out of all of this, what has been the most fruitful of the work that you've been doing? I mean, is it seeing a children conviction? Is it seeing, you know, some of this legislation that has been long time ignored now being recognized? 
No, I think that the biggest is that I remember in 2014, people thought we were crazy, right? People were like, you're being <laughs> Yeah. You no, know, I remember we went to some cities and people were like, don't bring that mess here. Don't bring, and you're like, bring it to you. The police are killing people in your neighborhood. You just don't know, but like, they're already there. I'm not bringing it to you. Whereas now people get it. You know, when we did this big project on police unions in 2015, people inside the social justice community didn't want to do it. Like now everybody's talking about police unions, but we did it in 2015 and people literally were like, that's cute. And now people are like, that's a big deal. And we're like, yes, it's a big deal, right? So so that is probably the biggest sea change. You know, we're proud that everything that we have done, we have led on and defined the space, but there's so much more to do. Yeah. And so as you look with so much more to do, obviously we know that, uh, as you said, you're focusing on laws and policy. Um, and do you think that when we talk about police right now, uh, that conversation between police and community, do you think that it's getting better given the fact that we are, we have seen the convictions, we have seen more people becoming active, more people stepping out? Is that is that conversation gap getting better? So I think what's happening, I think that, I think, you know, when we poll people, people still generally like the police. But when we ask them, would you change and then insert something here across the board, people say yes. People are hungry now in a way for structural change. We have to make sure that we meet the moment, but people want it. And so for people who want to help to do the work that you do and be connected to your organization, how do they do that? Just go to campaignzero.org. We are there. Uh, go check out the campaigns, get involved. If you want to get involved, there's work to be done in every community. Yeah. And as an advocate, you know, take it to the streets. Obviously, you said when this thing happened, people just took to the streets. There was no real mass organization. It was just anger. Um, give me just a little bit before we go about how things have actually coalesced to become more of not just the individual, but now a corporate matter. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know yet. There are a lot of places that, that pledge to do something. We have to see what they're going to do. So I don't really have a great answer to that because I haven't seen a lot of corporations do structural things around the police. I think that corporations have tried to do work internally with their own companies. And that's, that's good. That's not the work that I lead on. I lead mm -hmm. on change around the police. So I don't know yet. I think that that might've been more of a PR spin for a lot of places uh, than structural, but we'll see. We'll be making ass of corporate America for the next legislative cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll have a better sense. Yeah. And speaking of PR, got to give an opportunity for let you uh, talk a little bit about your book. So show us a little bit about your book and what readers can uh, enjoy. It's called The Other Side of Freedom. It is uh, an exploration both of the early set of protests and then how we should think about policing and think about public safety in a way that actually does help us get beyond the police as key to public safety. Uh, OK, where people where can people pick it up? They can just go, uh, if you go to Duray.com, Duray just my name, you'll be able to uh, buy it, but it's everywhere books are sold. So in stores, on Amazon, wherever you buy books. How long did it take you to get to, to put that together? Forever, it almost killed me, but I'm happy <laughs> the book is out. <laughs> well, Duray, I want to thank you for coming to be with us here on the Social Justice Forbes. Uh, definitely welcome back to, uh, you're welcome to come back and share with us and let us know uh, what's happening. And if you want to raise your voice on the matter, you got an open platform here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. All right, DeRay McKesson, our guest here on the Social Justice Forums. And uh, that about wraps it up for the Social Justice Forums. I'm Darren Jaime saying thank you. And listen, if you want to come join us next week, we'll elevate the conversation. We're going to have some more conversations about the inequities that many people face and are dealing with, but not only just have a conversation, but also talk about solutions. Thank you for joining us here on the Social Justice Forums. We'll check you back next week.